start off with annuities. Yeah, I'll just read a little blurb there. Most of us aren't able to put a large sum of money in the bank today or any given day. Right? So instead we save for the future by depositing a smaller amount of money from each paycheck into the bank. Right? So sometimes it's uh, direct withdrawal from your, uh, from your salary. Uh, and, and that happens when you have like, you know, a 401k, you know, the, and you know, if you, if you have a, um, a job that has some fringe benefits, one of those benefits could be that the company matches, you know, like dollar for dollar, um, uh, you know, once the last recession hit, it, that, that kind of went away for a little while. In some cases they just reduced it where it was like, you put in a dollar into your retirement savings and they'll put in 20 cents. And you'll be like, oh, how generous of you. But if you put in $100, they'll put in $20, right? So it's still money, right? $1,000 and so on, $100,000, you know, you can, um, you can start making money that way. But, you know, like some of the, some of the higher paying jobs uh, offer the match. And, and sometimes they do that in lieu of actually giving you a higher salary. So they'll say, okay, we're gonna pay you at this rate, but we'll contribute to your retirement plan. That's something you neg negotiate upon uh, or in the hiring process. Um, I know as a teacher, there, there is no negotiation. I mean, there was some wheeling and dealing back in the 90s and the early 2000s, but that went away. It's like, how many years have you taught? This is what you're getting paid. How many credits do you have beyond your master's degree? Uh, that puts you on a chart and where you are on that chart is how much you get paid, right? So it's not performance based. And, and so that, that's one of those things, you know, in terms of um, teachers and tenure and things like that, where it's, where they would say, oh, these teachers, they have it, they have it made, they have tenure. We have also no room to negotiate our salaries, right? So there is a little bit of a trade off there where you go into the corporate world, you don't have the job security but you can make a lot of money if it's performance based, right? And you negotiate the right salary, right? Either way, it, you know, there's, there's pros and cons, but either way, you're gonna wanna put away something for retirement, right? So uh, this idea is called the savings annuity. Most retirement pl plans like 401k or IRA plans are examples of savings annuities, right? So um, if in the workforce, if you're offered a, a 401k, and you know, look into it because you never know, right? And I, I find that the, some of the more advantageous things financially that you could do aren't really advertised. So if you're working for a company, they may, they may not tell you that they're gonna match your 401k, or your contributions to the 401k. Like, it, you, you just have to figure it out on your own because if they announce it, then everybody's gonna do it, you know? So that that's another possibility, but you know, that's, that's pretty rare, especially with the bigger companies. Right? So this formula, very intimidating, which is why we have a finance app, but the ingredients are the same ingredients, just um, they're abbreviated different ways, right? So the P sub N, I have it all noted down here, P sub N is the balance after N years. So N is time in years. So I'll make a note of that. N is time in years. D is the regular deposit, the amount that you deposit each month, year, day, you know, depending on how the uh, the account is set up. I don't know too many people that make uh, regular daily deposits to an account, right? So it's not as typical. Uh, R is the annual interest rate in decimal form. So it's kind of the same as what it's always been. K is the number of compounding periods in one year, All right? So that's the whole monthly equals 12, daily equals 365. You could have uh, quarterly equals four and so on. All right, that's all listed earlier in the packet. All right, so monthly, daily, quarterly, semi-annually, right, um, weekly, I guess. I mean, any, any kind of time uh, increment is, is a possibility. It's just not all of them are likely when it comes to, uh, the, you know, how the financial world works. I'm gonna make a better looking squiggly bracket here. 
slightly better. Not my, not my best work. All right. Uh, and a little asterisk here, and this is something that we talked about in uh, the earlier part of the unit. If the compounding frequency is not explicitly stated, then we assume that the number, uh, the comp number of compounding periods in the year will be equivalent to the number of payments made each year. All right. There's other formulas or other techniques, that, <coughs> sorry, that you could use to figure out like if you're getting compound interest monthly, but you make a deposit every two weeks, you know, it, it, there's a, a different aspect of the formula that comes into play. A, a lot more complicated, and what happens is people just use technology for that, you know, software. Yeah. I, I can't imagine, I mean, I've never worked in a payroll office, but I can't imagine they're sitting there with a uh, NumWorks calculator running the, running the numbers. They, they have software. They, put, they feed the information in, and the algorithm takes over and spits out what the results ought to be. All right. So take you through, like I said, I'll take you through an example where we do it by hand, and then, uh, and by hand is still on the calculator. So it's just using this formula, the scary looking formula. Traditional IRA is a special type of retirement savings in which the money you invest is exempt from income taxes until you withdraw it. All right? And we talked about that a few classes ago. Uh, if you deposit $100 each month into an IRA earning 6% interest, how much will you have in the account after 20 years? So it's almost like we're sort of treating it like, you know, just an ordinary savings account with recurring deposits. Right? And that's because we don't have any tax considerations here. Right? So if you put in $100 a month, that's great. That's money that's coming out of your paycheck. You've already been taxed on that. But any amount of money that that earns over time, you know, you file your taxes every year, any amount of interest that's earned over time would have to be taxed, right, if it were an ordinary savings account. But in an IRA, it doesn't get taxed until you withdraw it, and that's the, the whole rationale is that you'll be in a, a lower tax bracket. The older you get, you, know, you retire, you're in a lower tax bracket, you're gonna get taxed at a lower rate than you would you know, in your prime, as they say. All right, so, uh, so I'm gonna look at the P sub N, the D, the R, the K, and we don't want to forget about the N. I just kind of make a list of these values. All right. So P sub N's balance is the balance in the account after N years. All right. So in this case, it's saying how much will you have in the account after 20 years. All right. So that's unknown. I put a little question mark there. They're telling us we're going to deposit 100 bucks a, a month at an interest rate of 0 0.06, because this uh, the, the way this formula is structured, it calls for decimal value rather than uh, percent value. K is the number of compounding periods in the year. They didn't tell us how often the interest would be compounded, but the, the standard rule of thumb is the number of payments would be per year would be equal to the compounding periods per year, right? But the examples I gave before, you know, like interest is compounded monthly but you deposit bi-weekly you know that that's a special case all right so we're going to say 12 for number of compounding periods per year because we're making monthly payments and n is going to be well it's 20 years n is time in years so that's just going to be a 20. the formula is going to take care of how many total compounding periods you have over the life of the annuity all right at least until you're ready to pull money out of it and we have a formula to handle that too. So P sub N is equal to D times double parentheses, one plus R over K to the N K power minus one all over R over K. I'm just rewriting the formula that was above. All right, so same formula. Just sloppy handwriting, I guess. And we're going to crunch the numbers because we are looking for P, P sub N. 
So I can put in these values directly into the formula and it'll spit out the answer. I mean, I suppose that's uh, all you could ever ask for in a formula. So I have a $100 monthly deposit. I'll try to stabilize this iPad here. $100 monthly deposit, open parentheses twice. And, and the reason why it's twice is because I need parentheses for the one plus R over K. And I also need parentheses to uh, capture the negative one. All right, so one, why is this all of a sudden not easy to work with? Uh, one plus, 0.06 over 12 raised to the, uh, that's the NK power, so 20 times 12, minus 1 all over 0.06 over 12. All right, so you're just plugging and chugging away. All right, so we just got to pop this into the calculator and and it'll give us the result. Just got to be careful about parentheses and things like that. So in my calculation menu, I was doing a different problem earlier. Let me get rid of that. I'm going to start off with the 100, open paren twice, 1 plus 0.06 divided by 12, close it up, raise it. Remember that x to the y key is the one where you raise it to the power. All right, so the one below that is x squared, as in it'll raise it to the second power, but the x to the y power raises it to any power that you want. All right, what some people will do is hit that x to the, the second key and then just go back and edit the two to what you really want it to be. Either way is fine. All right, so uh, 20 times 12, right arrow to get out of the exponent, minus 1, close the paren. That gives me the whole numerator. Then I just divide by 0 0.06 divided by 12. All right, so this uh, lovely computation is going to get the job done. It's going to tell us you know, how beneficial depositing that $100 a month was. Now, again, 6% interest. That's a, a little on the high side. So you know, take, with this, take this with a grain of salt. But it gives you a, a, a ballpark estimate. Uh, 50,054. You know, the Lord only knows. Thank you. I was like, I don't even recognize this answer. So, that's new. Yeah, just making stuff up over here. That's me. Call that back. And make sure everything else is right. It looks right. Yeah, that's the one I remember. So $46,204.09. Right. Now, that mistake of putting a 13 there would mean that interest would be compounded 13 times a year. It would also have to go in the other place. But it gives you a sense that the more frequently you compound your interest, the more money you stand to make. Right? So you know, if you can, you can compound your interest down to the nanosecond you'd make you'd make more money than you would if you compounded it annually All right. so I wanted to just kind of uh, well I'll take you through the TV TVM the finance app it really is a TVM time value of money calculator but they call it the finance app and I don't want to confuse people so there's just a couple of things because in in the finance app we can choose how often to compound uh, separately from how often we want to make payments. So it gives more flexibility. It also allows for, um, 
for you to make your payments in the beginning of the month or the end of the month. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to know down to the nearest day when I'm going to get to the, the amount of money that I'm targeting, you know. So, uh, but let me take you there. Finance. I'm sorry, uh, home, then finance. All right, we've been working with this for a little while now. Compound interest. Choose a parameter to solve for. You got to know what you're looking for, all right? So here we're looking for the future value of the annuity, all right? I want to know how much it's going to be worth after, what do they say, 20 years, all right? So I'm going to select FV, and it's going to give me all the ingredients that I need, or it'll give me a place to put all the ingredients. It's a better way of saying it. I'm just going to kind of tuck this in on the side here a little bit. A little big zoom here. So in the finance app, we're solving for FV. So again, that's that first screen you get to. Which one do you want to solve for? You want to solve for future value. And it gives you input fields, N, R percent, present value, the PMT, PYCY, and then you have a choice of payment end or begin. We're going to leave it at end. That's consistent with the formula that we're, going, that we're using here. All right, so for these kind of problems, anything that involves this particular formula, we're going to want to have it set to end. And we're going to assume that it's at the end of our first month that we make our, our payments, right? So it's kind of weird, but that's how this formula works. And if you want the, the finance app to accomplish the same thing, these are the settings you want to have. You want to have your present value equal to zero to start. And your payment happens at the end of whatever the cycle is. All right, now N is the number of payments. So I'm putting in 20 times 12 because we have 20 years worth of payments 12 times a year. The interest now goes in as a percentage. They said it was 6% somewhere, yes, yeah, 6%. I won't put the percent symbol there. The payment, they said 100 bucks. Cash flow is in the negative direction. So we say negative $100, right? Because it is a payment, it's a, it's a debit. You're paying yourself, but it's still money coming out of your pocket initially. It's kind of like, um, you know, you're paying yourself in the future, but in the moment, I have $100 less than, less than my wallet. So at present time, I'm short 100 bucks. I'll, I'll get it back plus interest down the line, but it's still a negative cash flow direction. So 12, 12 for the payments and compounding periods per year. And then once you get all that information in, which I have yet to do, You go right to confirm, and it gives you the same answer, all right? But I'll show you real quick. If I made it a begin, beginning, it's slightly off. Instead of being 46,204, it's 46,435, which is more advantageous. I mean, I'd rather it be that way. So if you have a choice, you want to go with begin. It, when you're investing money in, a, in some sort of savings, you want to you wanna make your deposits as often as you can. By doing it at the beginning of the month, you're, al you're able to earn more interest during that first month, right? So it kind of begs the question, like, why this formula is structured this way? Because you're not making a payment initially, and your first payment is happening at the end of a month, which at the end of your first month, which is really the beginning of the second month. 
right? So it, it's kind of confusing in that regard, but it uh, at the very least gives you a, a good estimate of what the, um, the result should be. Uh, also, I, in the real world, I might look at it as, okay, I'm going to make my payments at the end of each month, but I'm going to start off with an initial deposit of $100. So my present value would be negative $100 because we're making, that's our first deposit. Again, cash flow. And then leave it at end, you know, maybe, well, actually, no, I think it would make more sense to put it at the beginning in that context. So you make your very first payment, the beginning of your first month, and then set it to beginning. And you get you get something different. You know, it's off still by a few hundred bucks. Right? So the way this formula works is not quite consistent with the way that we would do things in the real world. But, um, but we're looking for consistency here. Um, and again, if I put 100 here, oops. We're short by $100. Right? So there's no easy fix except to leave the PV value as zero and leave the payment value to end or set it to end. And that's the one that's going to give us the quote unquote correct value. And again, it's not a matter of what's correct in your everyday life. It's more like what's correct in terms of what gives you an answer that's the same as what this formula will give you. All right, so those two settings will do the job. Now, for number two, you want to have 200000 in your account when you retire in 30 years. So we're going the other way, where we want to have a certain amount of money. I just want to know how much I'm going to put in the account every month, right? how much I'm going to deposit, how much am I going to have them take out of my salary. Right? So these values are still in play. So in this formula, the PN takes on the role of the final value. Because like I said, we're going to, you know, I did it once with the formula, now I'm going to work exclusively with the app. All right? And that final value should be 200000 D is unknown. That's the same as PMT. R is your interest rate. You know, so... That would be as R percent. In this case, they're saying 8%. More and more generous as we go through the problems. None of these percentages are, are realistic these days. Uh, da, 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 K, number of compounding periods. Well, they say we're making the deposit every month. And a month, uh, months happen 12 times each year. So that would be uh, P slash Y or C slash Y, making that 12. That's the, the finance app variation of that. And then N is the, in this case, is the number of years based on the formula. All right, so this is the number of years. But in the finance app, we need number of compounding periods. So what I would do is I would take this N and instead of, I'm going to make these little arrows here because it's not really equal, it's just what they become. All right, that N, we're going, to, we're going to compute N times K. All right, and that's going to go in as the N value. All right. So this will go in as the N value. So we're overusing the letter N, which is unfortunate. That's what happens when you have to reconcile or you try to reconcile two different methods with one another. Sometimes the letters that are chosen to represent one technique are not consistent with the other. But we can pull from the problem what we need. What I want to solve for is it's how much we're going to make as a payment each month. So we're going to, in the finance app, we're going to solve for payment, all right? 
So in my initial screen here, once I go into the compound interest part of the app, I'm going down to PMT and I'm selecting that. And it just reorganizes the fields, the input fields. All right, so N is number of payments still. R percent, we need PV, FV, and then below that is the PYCY. I'll clean this up in a second. And then we're always going to set the payment to end. And so bring it in and kind of zoom to fit. All right. So they told us that we're still making monthly payments, so 12 times a year. The future value, I want it to be 200000 The present value is, is nothing. We start off with no money in the account. The interest rate was 8%. And the number of compounding periods, I want this to happen over 30 years. So it's right here, 30 years. This is, again, that's the overused capital N. This N represents the number of payments that you're going to make over the life of the annuity. All right, so total number of payments would be 30 times number of compounding periods. All right, so that's where I'm getting the, the NK from the other formula. All right, so I put these values in, 360, 8, 0, excuse me, 0, 200,000. One, two, three, four, five, yeah. Payments per year, compounding periods per year, 12, 12, end, and then write to confirm. And it tells us that we're going to get, or we're going to have to make a payment each year of $134.20 uh, each month, sorry. All right. Now, the, the nicest part about this is because interest is involved, if you were to just you know, put on your mattress every, every month $134.20, it wouldn't really get too close to, it would, it would get up there over 30 years every month. I mean, that's pretty substantial. Uh, but it's not going to get to 200000 It's the interest that's going to get us the rest of the way. So if I do in my home screen, I do $134.20 and multiply it by the number of payments at $134.20, which would be 360, 30 years, 12 times a year. $48,312. Assuming I didn't make a computational error. I mean, that's nowhere near 200000 Right, the interest is what's getting us to the two hundred thousand. Right, so, so this is the correct monthly payment, but you can see the benefit of putting it in an interest-bearing account. The higher the percentage, the better. The more stable that high percentage is, even better. All right, but let me just show you. I'll put in something a little bit more consistent with today's market. Go down to one and a half percent. You'd have to put four hundred and forty dollars away every month. Question. This? Yeah. I changed the eight to a one point five. Right. So by by having a nice high interest rate of 8%, we would only have to put away $134.20 per month. But if I only was getting 1.5% interest, I'd have to put away 
almost a little over four hundred and forty dollars. All right, so less of that total of two hundred thousand now would be of interest. It's going to be more of my own contributions. So if I do four hundred and forty times three hundred and sixty. In order to get to $200,000 at the end of 30 years, I would have had to personally contribute over $158,000. That's the power of compounding, uh, compounding your interest. I mean, it's still, I mean, you kind of look at it and say, well, I mean, if we never lived in a world where interest rates were high, you know, like they were always 1% or 2%, then you, it's like, okay, that's just the, the going rate. But, I mean, I've lived in a world where interest rates were 5.5%, right? So 5.5%, you know, kind of splitting the, splitting the difference there. I could make a $220 payment every month, and it would end up being $200,000. So 220 times 360, I would have only had to contribute almost, you know, around $80,000. The rest would be an in interest, right? So like this goes both ways because in this world that we live in, you don't get 8% interest on a, on a savings. On an annuity, you know, because it, the, the way it's, it's structured is, you know, you have a finance manager who handles your account. They invest your money. You know, like you decide, do you want it to be low risk, medium risk, or high risk? In the short term, you, know, you could have a high risk portfolio and you might see some, some high returns, eight to 10%, but it's not gonna be consistent over the long run because those uh, high risk ones are the most volatile, right? So most fluctuation. In the short term, volatility is a good thing because if I'm just putting money in an account, and, and it's really more for, I mean, it's not really so much an account as much as investing in the stock market. If you catch the wave on the way up, then you can make a lot of money in a short period of time. Right? But to count on that being the case with all that volatility, to count on that being the case over a 30 year period is just, it's absurd. Right. So in the case of an annuity, what what they recommend is kind of a medium risk. I mean, the common sense tells you that would be the case. Low risk, low percentage increase, not so much money earned based off the money invested. Medium risk, what could happen is it, it, it I mean, you're really playing you're playing the probabilities. It's like playing the game of roulette. Right. So you make a bet and it's one of those little little wins you know like you only win five bucks another bet you lose two dollars but then the next bet you win a hundred and fifty dollars and now you're playing with that amount of money so it can compound upon itself and that's the way it works with with annuities you can in a short period of time gain a lot of capital and then the market stabilizes right balanced out by your low risk investments, it stabilizes to the point where you're kind of, you've, you know, like the, what do they call it? The uh, a rising tide raises all ships or something like that. High tide raises all ships, boats, you know, like high tide comes in, every boat goes up, you know, so, but that, that becomes the new normal, right? So you're living at, let's say double your original investment. And now that became your baseline, right? That's, that's the benefit of doing something that's kind of middle of the road. You could see how bad it could be where you could, you might need to contribute $48,000 only. And that's not, you know, it's a lot of money, but if you know that over a period of time by making a hundred dollar, $134 investment, that over 30 years, it's going to become 200,000 when really you would only be paying in about 48,000 and then compare that to the instance where the interest rate, uh, so that was the high interest rate, the 8%, compare that to the instance where the interest rate is one and a half percent and you'd have to foot the bill for 158,400, right? So, and it, it, you know, you're not paying that all in one shot, so it's like, who cares? But on a monthly basis, you're paying $300 more than 
then you might need to, all right, just by uh, making some savvy investments. As opposed to not making an investment in the sense that you're not putting the money in the account, you're putting it under your mattress, that would give you 100 times 360, you would walk away with $36,000, right? That's also not anything to sneeze at. Right? You put in $100 a, a month, every month, a little vacation fund, that's, that kind of thing. But to know that that 36000 could have been 200000 know, And, you know, I, I'm overselling it a little bit because it's not like you have control over the interest rates. Right? It's just knowing that when the interest rates are good, that's when you want to be investing your money. I mean, if you're just going a simple savings route, you, know, you, you want to make as savvy investments as, as possible. Like if interest rates are low and you're in the market to buy a house, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to save my money up for the next 20 years. I'm going to sock away $100 a month for, for the next 30 years. And I'll, I'll have $200,000. I could buy a house with that, or a condo anyway in this area. But the market's going to change. Right? In order for you to get the most in savings, the interest rate would have to be high. Right? If you're looking to buy a house now and the interest rates are low, you buy the house. Right? That, we're going to get into the, uh, the annuity aspect of it. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, loans aspect of it in a second. But when one is to your advantage, usually the other is to your disadvantage. Right? Interest rates are low. Savings accounts not really a good idea. Investment in property if you have the means. Uh, we all have to have somewhere to live, so it all depends on whether you want to buy or rent. But if the interest rates are high, maybe you rent an apartment until and, and start saving the money. You know, like if interest rates are 1%, you don't rent an apartment, sign a lease for five years, and then hope to sock away enough money for a down payment. It's, it's going to be more advantageous to try to make the purchase now and then when interest rates go up then you then you work on your savings and it's a, there's a lot a lot that goes into it but it's um it's intricate you know and it's interesting to think about if you know entire lives and livelihoods didn't ride on it uh i'm going to skip the next one because as interesting of a problem as it is it's kind of absurd you're not putting $5 into an account every single day. I mean, even like uh, my little Acorns account, like I don't do that. You know, it's like once once a month or twice a month or whatever. You know, I suppose you could do it, but I don't think that's necessarily the savviest way to do things. All right, the payout annuity. Let's go on the other way. That's page 10. So the payout annuity has us starting, kind of starting at the end, right? So you kind of look at it like, and I'll just draw a diagram because I otherwise I got to write it like an essay here. So you start work, oops. So you start, you get your first job, you decided you're going to open a, an annuity an IRA, and you're going to save money up over time. All right, so start work slash start annuity. Then that money is going to increase in value. And, you know, it might increase like this, where it, you know, starts off steadily, and then it's, it, you know, the market turns, and it's like to your advantage, you end up doing really well. But I'm just going to assume that it's just sort of a, a gradual increase. And then you get to this point here where you retire. And at that point where you retire, you're not getting income from your job anymore. Right? Unless you're part of a like New York State retirement system, you know, like you're a public employee, then you could pay into that retirement system and, and get a pension. Right? Anything that involves any job that offers you a pension, you know, if it's not in the public sector, you might really want to consider it just because they, they don't always offer it anymore. They, they let you 
take care of that yourself through 401ks and 403bs for um, public workers. So then once you retire, you start, music overusing the word start here, start withdrawing money. And so your retirement savings account starts losing value, right? Because you're taking money out as you go. You're taking money out, whether it's monthly, hopefully not daily, but money's coming out. And actually, that, that might be a way to go. Money's coming in. Then money's coming out. And eventually you get to the point where you reach the end, which isn't a fun experience. I'll just say end. Because one way or another, it comes to an end. Hopefully not, I always hate this part of the lesson. Like hopefully you don't run out of retirement savings before you die. It's never, never comfortable saying that, but that, that's the idea. Because what happens? You know, you run out of money, and now you got all these medical bills coming in. But you don't want to. I'm gonna say it again. Die long before the investment account runs out of money, because then your account has outlived you. So it's it's kind of a depressing thing to th to think about, but you kind of want the two things to happen simultaneously. Right? So you have the money until the end, but your end and its end coincide with one another. Right? That, that, that's an indicator that you manage your money properly. Right? Um, yeah, anyway, off of that, Let's do something less depressing. I mean, we're going to actually do the depressing scenario here. Just we'll focus on the math. All right. So you have this formula. Question. Yeah. When you start taking out, um, you, stop you still will earn interest, but only on what remains in the account. Right. So it's it's the event that you're pulling money out of the account, like at at the moment you retire, right before you start withdrawing money, that is the most amount of money that you'll have in the account, earning the most interest in terms of dollar value. But now you're taking out, let's say, $1,000 a month, $2,000. I mean, Westchester, I mean, could be a lot more than that, right? But you're withdrawing from your, your savings account. And so that money that's still there is still going to accrue interest. It's still earning money but there's less money to earn money. Right. So my scenario here, after retiring, you wanna be able to take $1,000 every month for a total of 20 years from your retirement account. The account earns 6% interest. How much will you need in your account when you retire? All right. So here, oh, uh, you know what? I got bit by the copy paste monster. That piece of end should be a piece of bow. It's just this formula is so similar to the uh, the other one that when I put it in here, I just copied it over and I forgot to change that part of it. Right, everything else is correct. So you can see there's a lot more negative going on here. Right? But it's still the same ingredients. It's just in the case of savings, you know, making deposits into an account that's earning interest, the highest or the the greatest amount of money that you'll have would be at the end of that term. Here, the greatest amount of money that you're gonna have is at the beginning of the term. So this, for the, the on the upswing, this is gonna increase till you get to P sub N, all right? But then on the way down, that P sub N becomes P sub O, all right? So it becomes P sub O and it takes over on the way down, all right? So the final amount for the, the initial 
component of the, the upswing becomes the initial amount on the downswing. All right? So essentially, these two numbers will be equal. It's just a matter of perspective. Right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, not to get into the physical sciences too much, but most people know the terms uh, potential and kinetic energy. You know, so it, it, you kind of look at it that way, where you have kinetic energy that's being transferred into potential energy, and then it starts moving in the opposite direction. So the end of one part becomes the beginning of the second part. Think of this as two legs of a trip. You, know, you drive into um, driving to Chicago, and you stop off in Pittsburgh. You know, you drive one. The, you know, Thursday night you drive to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is the destination. Friday morning, when you're starting the rest of the trip, Pittsburgh is now your starting point. It's your origin. Okay, that's the idea here. All right. That's all the analogies I got for that. So we want to have, again, 20 years, 6% interest. All this stuff is there, but we could go right into the, uh, the finance app and do this. Because, again, like I said, we don't want to have to do the formula every single time. But I will show you, you know, not the computations, but what each of these values would be based off of the phrasing of the question. P sub O, it's saying how much will you need in your account when you retire? That's what I'm looking for. I have no idea. And also, when, when we do stuff like this, we tend to work back to forward, you know, back to front, whatever. I don't know how else to say it, but uh, backwards. You know, we start at the end and our, we work our way back to the beginning, right? So I want to know how much I need to have in my account when I retire in order to survive if I'm going to withdraw a certain amount every month, right? Uh, yeah, it is every month, right? So I, I have no idea. Now, the easy answer would be to say as much money as possible, but, you know, what's possible? I have no idea, All right? So this will help us figure out what our final amount should be and then we could go back and work with the other formula to figure out how much that would amount to in monthly payments over the first leg of the trip all right so d is a, a regular withdrawal oops so that's negative 1000 uh r is the interest rate again very generous six percent K is the compounding periods of one year. We're still going with 12. And N is the number of years, which would be 20 years. All right. So that D value is going to become our PMT in the app. This 0.06, that's R percent equals 6. That 12 is payments per year P and Q probability sorry uh, payments per year or compounding periods per year it's going to be 12 and then we just have to account for the n in the app which is different from this and that's the number of payments overall right total payments that would be 20 times 12 so uh, 240 again. So in my app, again, compound interest. We're always living in the compound interest part of it, so there's no uh, guesswork there. It's just first two steps that going into the app are always the same. All right. So you select compound interest and then identify the thing that you're solving for. All right, so now what I'm looking for is the present value. So I'm going to go to that. So I need N, R percent, FV, the PMT, PY, CY. And that last one you could take for granted, the, the payment, 
we're always just going to leave that on end. So you don't really have to write it if you don't want to, but this early on, maybe. Alright, so 240 payments. Sorry. 6%. The payment per month is going to be negative 1,000, still negative cash flow. And this time from the perspective of your account. Payments per year, compounding periods per year. The only question here is because we're going to identify or, or determine what PV is. Like, well, what's the future value? So in the context of the problem, it's implied that this individual is, is fine using all the money at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the 20 years, which really gets kind of depressing because like, oh, uh, how do you know? You know, it's like, well, figures, okay, I just retired. I, I got 20 years left of me. I mean, that's pretty sad. But, uh, but you know, people think that way. Uh, if you've ever... I don't know too many people who really admit to this, but if you've ever taken out a life insurance policy, you can see just how heartless that industry is. I mean, they basically charge you money per month based on whether you're going to whether they think you're going to survive the next year. That's how the computations are are determined. So if you take out a life insurance policy and they're like, "Oh, good news, we." We got you a nice policy. It's going to cost you $500 a month. You should be like, oh, crap. If it's like $30, $50 a month, you're like, oh, okay, you, you have some faith in me. You know, It's just basically them saying that we're taking a risk on insuring you. The more we make you pay into that risk, the less we believe in your state of health. What a world. So the future value should be zero, right? Because again, he wants to do, well, you, I'm, I'm the you in this scenario. So I want to be able to withdraw every month for a total of 20 years, right? So it, I, it's, you know, a more, a non-morbid uh, kind of counter example is I'm only going to need it for 20 years because my great grandkid is going to become a famous musician and they're going to, you know, pay the rest of the way in my life. And so there we go. Now we're all happy. So the computation part is easy. We don't have to use the formula. We just use the app. So 240 months, 6%, future value zero, you're taking out thousand dollars every month and so you would need to have a hundred and thirty nine thousand dollars five hundred hundred and thirty nine thousand five hundred and eighty dollars further I get away from being in middle school the less I'm able to like actually name the number you know it's like uh yeah, it's uh, 139580 dollars. And it was like, maybe I should at least try to say it the right way. $139,580.77. That's what I would need to have in my account at the beginning of my post-work life. All right. Now, let's just play around with the numbers. Say the interest rates are only 3%. I would need to have about $180,000 instead of $140,000, all right? It's only 1%. Now again, the question's not asking this, but it's kind of a uh, public service thing. I would need to have almost $220,000 in that account, all right? So on the, on the front end of that little parabola there, you can afford to be optimistic. You can't be optimistic on the back end. All right? You have to be pessimistic because the market could change and you could be at a point where you were trending towards whatever you thought the target value was. You're, you're going by 
I'll leave this up here. You're going by like the prevailing rates at, at this moment in time. And maybe, for example, let's say back in the early 2000s, the interest rate was 5%. So you're saying, okay, I'm going to get 5% on my annuity, even after I start withdrawing. And then 20 years go by, now you're retired and interest rates are only down to 1%. Yeah, you might have built up some capital over that time, but it might not be enough to support the lifestyle that you've chosen in your post-work life. Right? So we assume the worst on the back nine. On the front end, you could, you could afford to be a little optimistic. So what I would do, this is exactly what I said not to do when, it's, when you're building your savings. If you're determining the worst case scenario, assume no interest. Right? So I would be looking at this and saying, I need $1,000 a month for 20 years. I'm going to make sure that my retirement savings account has $240,000 in it at the, end of my, at the end of my upswing. All right? Because then, now, now I'm kind of, um, I, I want to say living on borrowed Time, but that, that's like the opposite of what I'm trying to say. It's now I'm uh, spending house money, right? Because any interest that would be earned over zero dollars is going to prolong the amount of time that I'll have my savings account, right? So I'm still pulling a thousand dollars a month out of that account, but if the interest rates increase, then that could last me longer than the 20 years I projected, and it's all projections because right, you can't control the market all right so the way i would handle this i'll just kind of create a side example here just trying to think where i'd put it i'll just steal the room room for number two so i'm going with the worst case scenario I'll just do it up here. I always think of these different application problems right when I'm teaching it, never beforehand. So let's say I, I, I want to do that $1,000 withdrawal at the end of, or at each month during the 20 years after, after I retire. All right, so same scenario. How much per month do I need to deposit in the annuity, I'll say in the IRA, and this does, I gotta be very upfront about this, this does, does not account for taxes, okay, so that's the other thing. Uh, how much per month do I need to deposit in the IRA over, let's see, most people start working around 20, like on average, say 45 years, so over 45 years at, I'll say 2% interest. All right, so how much per month do I need to deposit? So I'm taking this same concept, but I'm looking at it from a different perspective. All right, so we have our little diagram. I'll just do it off on the side here. Up, then down. This is retirement. All right, now we just determined, if we assume that this is true, we just determined that we need to have $139,000 roughly in the account at the moment we, that I retire or one retires in order to maintain that $1,000 withdrawal every month from there on out, all right? Now, the length of time, you know, it's time value of money. Time is the biggest influencer on the value 
in the account. I mean, you could have 10% interest, but if you only invest for half a year, you're not going to see much of a return on that. All right, so these are for long-term investments. Okay, so in this scenario, back into the finance app, I would want to know the payment. So I'm solving for payment. That does not require a colon. All right, so solving for payment, 45 years, all right, so N is going to be 45 times 12, because that N there is number of payments, all right? That's, that's the one thing I, I don't really like about the app. I wish it would adhere, adhere to the formula a little bit better, but it is what it is, so we just kind of deal with it. Interest rate, 2%. All right, so this is a scenario because eventually it became 6%, you know, after you retire, maybe the market turned, you got lucky. I mean, that, that could be the case because you don't, you don't really want it to be the other way around, at least if it's going to be a, a massive pendulum swing. You don't want to have the high interest rates on the way up and then the low interest rates on the way down because that, you know, like you'll have a, a large capital uh, balance, but you're not going to get the return on that money over time less and less return as you take more money out, right? Now, if it's only a minor swing, it's not that big of a deal, but it's it's noticeable when, when you need it the most. Because it's not like, uh, you know, you, you go out and work a second job to make a little extra money. <clears throat> I don't know who does that. But when you're younger, you can. When you're retired, there's a reason why you're retired, right? Now, some people retire, like if you're a cop, firefighter, you, you retire, but you're still 40, you know, so you move on to the next phase of your life. That's a different story, all right? The present value is going to be equal to that $139,580 and 77 cents. Can't forget about the 77 cents. Well, the, the IRS tends to forget about that. They, they forget about it when you're filing, but they remember it when you need to pay it. Uh, future value. Oh, sorry, I got that backwards, my bad. I, I forgot what perspective I was using. We're starting with nothing, and we want to get to that future value of $139,580.77. Not a penny less, all right. all right? Because the future value on the upswing is the present value on the downswing, all right? And then everything else is the same as it always is, so I'm not gonna write it, all right? And so we're gonna get a PMT out of this. So again, 45 times 12, Interest rate 2% on the way up, starting with nothing, hoping to get to $139,580, 139580 $139, and $0.77. And confirm, and it says that we have to put in $159.58 on the way up so that we can pull a thousand dollars a month on the way down. That's not bad. I mean, I, you, that's a pretty solid trade-off. Now, time again is the biggest influencer because the only reason that I'm paying, aside from interest rate being much lower, right? Uh, because I'm doing it over a longer period of time, I can afford to put less money away each month, right? And pull over a shorter period of time much more money, right? So. You look at a scenario like this and you just start kind of mapping out the future and you say, okay, it's not too late. I can start, I can start a retirement plan. I'll put in, well, it's about 2% these days. I'll put in a couple hundred bucks a month. And I know we don't always have that, but whatever you can spare, you put aside whatever you can each month for 45 years, eh, less for me, it's like down to 20 now. 
but I've been saving. I've had money in my retirement account. Every like they, I believed everything that the older, wiser folks told me when I when I first graduated college. They're like, even if it's only twenty dollars a paycheck, put whatever you can aside. You'll thank me later. And you know, later hasn't come yet, so there's no thanking anyone. But I do see my account growing over time, my retirement account. Okay, so there is, uh, there's, there's definite value in this. This portion of the course is known as the please save money portion of the course. And it's like me showing you problem after problem, trying to convince you that 40 years from now, you're, you're gonna either love your younger self or you're gonna not be too happy with your younger self. And so if anything, think of this diagram. Right? What we want this diagram to be is steep on the way up, then you hit some sort of apex, and then something like this on the way down. Right? This is this is more ideal. I don't want to say it is ideal because I didn't really this is off the cuff. But you start off with nothing. You get as much money as you're gonna get on the upswing. And then you want to have like a gradual decrease on the way down. That that would be the best case scenario. But again, can't control interest, but you can control time, right? As in starting to put money aside as early and as often as you can. Right. Then you buy a house, 30 year mortgage at some obscenely high interest rate, but you got a good deal on it. 10 years down the line, interest rates drop through the floor down to like 2%, you refinance and now, now you're a happy camper. And it, decisions like that will set you up, set you up for life. Right. Uh, loans, honestly, I don't want to waste too much more time with it. It's not, it's not a waste of time, um, but I don't want to kind of rehash the same stuff over and over again. The, the way the finance app works, it treats loans and annuities where you're the recipient of the payment. So the downswing, it treats them the same way. So what we just learned here for this first question is really how you would handle a loan also. And that, that's the thing, because when when you're putting in, in in an annuity, you are both the investor and the borrower. You're the investor on the upswing. You're the borrower on the downswing. All right. So it's treated just like a loan on the downswing. All right. So, yeah, that's. It would be overkill if I did that. It's, it's better use of our time for me to talk about uh, the budget project a little bit. So we'll take, uh, take five, and then we'll come back and talk about that. I wanted to kind of take you through a, a fictitious example.